Hi everyone, I'm Gianna, I'm a sophomore and I go to school in Holland, Pennsylvania. And um, my project is on determining relationships between bacterial classification and antibiotics. So the purpose of this experiment is to determine relationships between gram classification and the four common antibiotics of penicillin, ampicillin, neomycin, and erythromycin. Um, and this information can help identify the effectiveness of these types of antibiotics on the types of bacteria I'm testing, and it can also aid in a treatment plan if a doctor is approached with bacterial infection. So some background, the two types of bacteria I used are gram-positive and gram-negative, and these classifications really just come from cell wall composition. Um, a gram-positive bacteria has a cell wall that is high in peptidoglycan, and a gram-negative um, bacteria also has a cell wall high in peptidoglycan, but it's surrounded by an outer lipid layer. Um, and the gram stain process is the process that I use to figure out the gram classifications of the two bacteria. Um, this involves using the chemicals crystal violet, grams iodine, ethyl alcohol, and saffron and stain in a very um, periodic, like 60 second interval time to see which ones would be um, attached to the substances found in the cell walls. The Kirby Bauer disdiffusion method is also a method I use to measure the zone of inhibition that the antibiotics created or potentially created on the bacteria. And this basically means just uh, measuring the diameter of the zone of inhibition if it was visible, and then comparing it to a reliable chart. Uh, Bacillus cirrus is the gram-positive bacteria I used, and then non-pathogenic E. coli is the gram-negative bacteria I used. Um, exponential growth is a very vague term in a sense, but in this project it's really specific to bacterial growth and how it grows in four different phases, the lag phase, the exponential phase, the stationary phase, and then the death phase. Um, this is crucial as to why I plated my antibiotics right after I inoculated the bacteria. I didn't let it grow first. I um, placed the antibiotic discs right after. And then the four antibiotics I used are first penicillin and ampicillin. They work relatively the same way by interrupting transpeptidation, which means peptide bomb formation cannot happen anymore, so the cell wall breaks down, and then the antibiotics can penetrate it. And then neomycin and erythromycin, they work also relatively the same way by binding to ribosomal subunits, which would block the ribosomal exit tunnel, so peptide bonds can't form at all either. So I first hypothesized that Bacillus cirrus would be susceptible to penicillin and ampicillin, and then resistant to neomycin and erythromycin. And I thought that the non-pathogenic E. coli would be resistant to all, just because it has that outer lipid layer, and I thought the antibiotics would not be able to penetrate it. The materials I used are agar and petri dishes, an inoculating needle, and a sterilization method, the bacillus cirrus live culture, the non-pathogenic E. coli live culture, the chemical stains, antibiotic discs, and bleach for disposal. My variables, so for my control, I did a petri dish with the placebo antibiotic disc, and I did this essentially because I wanted to uh, show that if there was no antibiotic on the bacteria, no zone of inhibition would be visible. My constants were all the materials listed the procedure for each trial, the time elapsed, the bacterial growing conditions, and the reference tools. My independent variable was the type of bacteria because it changed. And then the dependent variable is the diameter of the zone of inhibition in millimeters. Uh, for my methods, the first thing um, is safety hazards. I was working with bacteria, so I wanted to make sure there was no cross-contamination or um, nothing bad happened. So I basically just used 10% bleach, concentrated wipes all the time. I would periodically change my gloves. I would concentrate everything that touched or potentially touched the bacteria into a bucket so nothing got reused by accident. Um, so the first real step in this project was agar preparation and then I did my gram stain which involves inoculating the bacteria onto a microscopic slide and making it very flat so it's easier to see under the microscope. Then I did heat fixing to um, denature the enzymes. Then I did my chemical staining which I mentioned before and then I examined them under a microscope and then a gram positive bacteria would turn out like a purple color then a gram-negative bacteria would turn out like a pink-red-ish color. Uh, then next I did my antibiotic, antibiotic susceptibility test, which involves inoculating the bacteria onto the petri dishes, and then right after that, plating the antibiotics. And I did um, three trials for each set of like type of antibiotic and type of bacteria. Uh, then next was my evaluation. I used the Kirby Bauer disdiffusion method. So um, for example, I would take this disc that clearly has a big zone of inhibition and measure the diameter. And then I compared it with a chart on the next slide. This chart, so um, I used the same disc potency, which is based off the minimal inhibitory concentration, which is the least amount of antibiotic needed uh, for, t for it to kill bacteria. And I went down to, like the line of antibiotics to pick which one I used, and then 
I saw whether it was resistant, intermediate, or uh, susceptible. This is my data. So here's two pictures. This is the Bacillus cirrus under the microscope. Um, the picture's kind of distorted, but it's a purplish color, so it's gram positive. And then the E. coli is over there, and it was very like red, so it's gram negative. Um, this is after 24 hours. The Bacillus cirrus clearly had a very large zone of inhibition on for neomycin and erythromycin, telling me that it was susceptible to both. And the E. coli had a very large zone of inhibition just on neomycin, telling me that it was susceptible just to that and it was resistant to the rest. Um, after 48 hours, there wasn't really a huge change in um, data, uh, like susceptibility-wise. So the same antibiotics were resistant and the same were susceptible after 24 and 48 hours. Here's just a visual graph. It got a little cut off up here, but um, it's clearly seen that neomycin and erythromycin um, were, worked better on Bacillus cirrus, and that neomycin just worked good on the E. coli. So to conclude, the Bacillus cirrus was susceptible to neomycin and erythromycin, and I think this happened because neomycin is called an aminoglycoside, and erythromycin is a macrolide. And they, that means they both can just bind to ribosomal subunits, blocking the ribosomal exit tunnel. So peptide bond formation doesn't happen anymore, which breaks down the cell wall. And since all cells, whether they be from gram-positive bacteria or gram-negative bacteria, contain ribosomes, it um, worked. And then the Bacillus cirrus was resistant to penicillin and ampicillin. And I think this happened because the minimal inhibitory concentration potency was too small. Because um, I predicted that penicillin and ampicillin would be um, worked the best on Bacillus cirrus, and since it didn't, I just think it was a potency problem. Um, and then also the E. coli was susceptible just to neomycin, and once again, this is because neomycin is, is an aminoglycoside. And then the E. coli was resistant to penicillin, ampicillin, and erythromycin, and I also think this could have happened because the minimal, minimal inhibitory concentration potency was too small, or that the outer lipid layer in the gram-negative bacteria could have um, I guess not allow the antibiotics to penetrate it. Um, these results are very important because it's an initial step in determining relationships between gram classification and antibiotics, and this could potentially aid doctors in treatment options for bacterial infections. For example, if they had a patient who had a bacterial infection that was a gram-positive bacteria, maybe neomycin and erythromycin would work better than penicillin and ampicillin would. Um, sources of error. So before I did this whole experiment, I did a pre-trial, um, and there were two things going wrong with that. The first one is I plated the antibiotic discs during the stationary phase, um, and it was inevitable that I would get no results because the bacteria wasn't growing anymore. It was already fully grown, so the antibiotics couldn't really do anything. Then I also used this bacteria called Rhodos priolum rubrum, which is also gram-negative bacteria, but it's very slow growing, and I didn't do the right growing conditions, so it didn't work for me. So I changed it to E. coli for this project. And then lastly, the antibiotic potencies were probably not strong enough for the amount of bacteria used, which is why it could have been classified as resistant. And lastly, for further research, um, the use of different antibiotic potencies could be used to see if the bacteria was truly resistant to the antibiotic or if it just wasn't potent enough to kill the, the bacteria. And also to validate my claim, you can use different bacteria of the same gram classification. For example, using multiple gram-positive bacteria instead of just Bacillus cirrus to um, sort of create a real relationship between the types of antibiotics they're susceptible or resistant to. Thank you. Yeah, well, because in my hypothesis, I did think that the E. coli would be resistant to all, so I was very, like, shocked, I guess, to say. Yeah. But then I did more research into it, and I realized that it's an aminoglycoside, and every cell, no matter what, contains a ribosome. So even if the antibiotic was able to bind to those ribosomal subunits, it could still attack the cell. Okay. Great. Thank you. So has any parent who's had a child with an ear infection can tell you it's about to create? Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't, but that would be a good idea for a new project. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.